Good morning. My name is Cheryl Neely. I'm a media relations officer here at the Washington Foreign Press Center. I'd like to welcome all of you today. We are pleased to have you and our special guests here for a preview of the U.S.'s new JPSS-1 weather satellite, which will be launching in November. And JPSS-1 will help with weather forecasting and with disaster preparedness around the world. So we're very excited to share this news with you today. Uh, the ground rules are that this is an on-the-record briefing, so you can record, you can film, and uh, we can have some uh, video available for you afterward. Please remember to turn off your cell phones if you have one with you. And I would like to introduce our briefers to begin. We have with us Dr. Mitch Goldberg, who is Chief Program Scientist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is known as NOAA, and he is with their Joint Polar Satellite System. Dr. Goldberg. And next we have Mr. Joe Pika, Director of the Office of Observations with NOAA's National Weather Service. Mr. Pika. We have Dr. Lars Peter Rieshoigard here. He is the director of um, a project with the Observing and Information Systems Office at the World Meteorological Organization. And thank you. And finally, we have uh, Mr. John Lee, deputy director at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA's Joint Agency Satellite Division. So I'd like to welcome all of our briefers this morning, and I'll ask Dr. Goldberg to begin. Thank you, um, Cheryl, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, we're just over a little bit, about two weeks away um, from the launch of JPSS-1, which will be first of a series of four highly advanced NOAA operational polar weather satellites that will improve the accuracy and timeliness of NOAA's weather prediction models and the three to seven day forecast. It not only benefits NOAA, it benefits the international community because every country with its own weather prediction center uh, uses um, observations from NOAA. So that's really important. So it really will advance NOAA's capability but also the international capability in weather forecasting. As you may know that NOAA, NOAA operates two different satellites, uh, geostationary, uh, which basically is at an orbit 22,000 miles, 22,300 miles above the Earth. Um, it rotates at the same speed. It moves at the same speed as the Earth's rotation, so it's always overhead. That satellite, um, you know, almost about a year ago, we had the launch of GO-16, and um, that data basically continuously observes weather. So as weather unfolds, the satellite continuously observes. Um, on the other hand, JPSS is a polar satellite. It observes, uh, it orbits the Earth from um, pole to pole, so south pole to north pole. It's in a lower orbit. It's about 512 miles above the Earth's surface. And as it orbits, uh, because it's in a lower orbit, the Earth is actually rotating. So we can get global observations and then of the entire planet, and that's really critical. So for example, a typhoon off, the, off of Japan will unleash uh, plumes of moisture and, 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 and precipitation to, the, to, the nor to North America. So that's why global observations are critical. So both uh, satellite systems are critical for NOAA to provide a complete picture of what's happening with the weather currently, what's happening today, what's happening to no tomorrow, and out to the next seven days and beyond. So that's why we have, we always say NOAA has two satellite programs, one, um, two satellites for one mission, and that's to, for weather forecasting. So weather forecasting is critical. We have to observe weather as it unfolds, but we also have to predict weather out to seven days to prepare for extreme weather events. So JPSS um, stands for the Joint Polar Satellite System. It will bring the latest and best technology that NOAA has ever flown operationally um, in polar orbit to uh, capture more precise observations of the Earth's atmosphere, land, water, that helps NOAA um, forecast after seven days. And Joe Pika will be talking more about that. Um, our satellites, uh, I'll talk more about the instruments later, but the critical data that's actually used for numerical weather prediction is um, atmospheric soundings of temperature and water vapor. That is, has been shown over and over again as the most critical data sets, data source needed to forecast weather out to seven days. And JPSS brings those capabilities uh, to National Weather Service and our partners. Now back in 2011, um, and here's a picture of um, JPSS-1 in the clean room, 
um, our partner, um, NOAA, and, uh, NOAA and our partner NASA want SUMI MPP. So SUMI MPP has been in orbit since uh, 2011, and it was really, it's really a precursor to JPSS-1. It was designed, it's, it's really a research mission that operated so well that NOAA made it operational. So, so our operational pole satellite today is, um, is SUMI MPP. It's our primary weather satellite for global weather. And, um, and once JPSS-1 um, is launched, it will become NOAA-20. It will be called NOAA-20. And we'll have um, two satellites in orbit, SUMI MPP and JPSS-1. With NOAA 20, NOAA 20 will become our primary weather satellite, and SUMI MPP will be our secondary. And so, um, so then uh, once we have NOAA 20, uh, JPS 1, uh, NOAA will have for the first time a next generation polar satellite and a next generation geostationary satellite working in tandem. So that's, that's really important. Um, so, JPSS has five highly sophisticated instruments. The instruments are so precise that it can measure, um, it has a temperature sensitivity of better than one tenth of a degree. So if you have a fluctuation in the atmosphere of a tenth of a degree, we can actually see it. And that's really critical for weather forecasting. So we have um, the advanced microwave, uh, advanced technology microwave sounder, that's called ATMS. And so, so basically I should step back a little bit. So we have uh, different instruments and they measure different parts of the, of the spectrum. And how we observe temperature and water vapor and all these other constituents is by looking at the outgoing radiation, the natural radiation of the atmosphere. So the microwave sounder measures outgoing radiation in the microwave and it sees different levels of the atmosphere of temperature and water vapor. And, and it can, because it's in the microwave, the wavelength is larger than cloud particles and you can actually penetrate through clouds. So we can see temperature and water vapor even through clouds. And it does a lot more than that. We can observe sea ice, for example. So we can monitor the changing ice in, in the Arctic. We can see um, snow cover. We can also um, look at precipitation rain rates. So over the U.S., we, of course, we use radar. Uh, radar is critical for observing precipitation. Over the ocean, there's no radar. And so we use the microwave to pro provide us with rain rates over, over the oceans. Now, because it's all sky um, and the microwave absorption lines are a little bit different, I know I'm getting a little technical in here, we can see temperature and water vapor throughout the globe, but it has somewhat coarse vertical resolution. So to improve the vertical resolution, which means I can see more information throughout the atmosphere, we have something called CRIS, the Cross Track Infrared Sounder. So CRIS is a hyperspectral infrared sounder. It has much higher vertical resolution. It provides high vertical resolution temperature and moisture and there's a lot of other things like uh, trace gases. It will see carbon monoxide plumes from a forest fire. It will uh, measure um, MSO2 plumes from a volcano. It does a lot more. Chris has more than 2,000 channels, and when you compare that to the old legacy set, uh, instrument on the NOAA POSE, um, for example, NOAA 19, um, it has, um, well, Chris has 2,000 channels where the POSE instrument only has like 19. And the vertical resolution of CRIS is like a factor of more than six. So I can see six times as more information in the atmosphere. So that's, that's, that's really important. But CRIS um, cannot see through clouds. So this is why we have a microwave and, and infrared sounders working in tandem. They work together in order to provide us with full coverage and high vertical resolution in place, cases where it's even partly cloudy. So we use the microwave to uh, help us in partly cloudy conditions. Uh, our third instrument on the lineup, so, so you can tell we have a lot of different instruments for a lot of different applications. So the third is VIRS. Um, VIRS is the Visible Infrared um, Imager, Imaging Radiometer Suite. It's also used for weather forecasting and environmental assessments. It's really our sentinel in the sky when it comes with to polar observations. So if you think of the GO-16, GO-16 is basically has an imager, a lightning mapper, it also has space weather instruments. But it's really imaging the clouds. And when you get towards the Arctic region, the polar regions, you really can't see that well up there. It's like seeing the side of a television set. It's, it's sort of the resolution degrades. But polar satellites, one single polar satellite will observe the poles uh, 14 times per day. So we get a lot more refresh. And so VIRS is critical for, for weather forecasting up in Alaska. Uh, and it does a lot more. It provides information on sea surface temperature globally, which is critical for the models. It tracks uh, flood, flood events. 
We recently used, uh, and also fire events, we used, recently used Veer's products um, to, um, to display, to be able to tell FEMA, for example, where there's widespread flooding for, for Harvey and for Irma. That was very, very important. And we also used it for, um, uh, recently, for tracking the power recovery in Puerto Rico. So if you look at that figure here, on the left is a static image of when all the lights are on in Puerto Rico. Uh, and on the right is, uh, you know, shortly after the storm hits, when the power went out. So you can see a lot, lot fewer lights. And what we're sending these images on a daily basis to FEMA and other uh, emergency managers um, to actually show the recovery of the power over time. So we're happy that we can help in that area. So, uh, so VIRS does, has a lot of capabilities. It also does, it's also used for monitoring, um, you know, volcanic plumes, eruptions, things like that. And also uh, lots of other things uh, like vegetation health. We can monitor globally because, again, uh, JPS is a polar orbiting satellite. We can monitor the entire globe. We can see droughts uh, not only in California. Now we see the recovery in California. But we can see droughts all corners of the globe. And so it's really, really important for uh, food security, for example. This is a picture of, uh, of um, an image of Veers at its, its 375 meter resolution. It's the highest resolution out there with respect to how much coverage um, it, can, it, it has. Uh, like there are, of course, there's sensors that have five meter resolution, one meter resolution, but the repeat cycle of that is like, like weeks. And, um, and with VIRS, we have a 3,000 kilometer swath. So we see every corner of the planet so easily. And this is at 375 meter resolution, and that's the eye of the storm. You can see it's well defined. We also have OMPS. Um, so OMPS is important for monitoring the ozone layer. And so we have, uh, so it's being used to monitor the recovery of ozone due to the Montreal port protocols and the reduction of CFCs. It's used as critical input that goes into our models, weather models, and it's actually as a critical source of data that goes into UV forecasting. So, you know, so it, it alerts the public, you know, when there's a high UV event in terms of, you know, to, uh, to tell the public not to stay in the sun out so long. And of course, it helps us monitor the Arctic ozone hole. Um, our last instrument is Ceres. That's a cloud and earth radiation energy system. And it, it's really used for earth radiation but budget studies and measures reflected sunlight and thermal radiation emitted by both clear and, and cloudy skies. So all these instruments, they, they work together, um, especially ATMS, Chris, and Veers, they work in tandem. Um, actually, Chris and OMS, they work in tandem too because OMS, which measures ozone and UV, can only measure ozone um, during the daylight. So as you know, there's parts of the day it's dark at night, but also you have long periods of darkness over the Arctic, um, Antarctica and Arctic. And um, so Chris, by the, for example, uh, you can derive ozone from Chris. So we actually integrate the two and, and create blended products so we have global coverage of ozone. So um, and another example how they work in tandem is that uh, Veers, for example, has very good sensitivity to fires. So we can actually see the location of very small fires. Um, and, and we can um, also know its temperature. And we've been actually using that information to predict smoke plumes. Um, so, so we can use the VIRS to track smoke plumes, forecast smoke plumes. And at the same time, CRIS, for example, will measure the carbon monoxide and methane that's emitted from a fire. So it allows us to see an uh, integrated view of how fires can impact air quality. So, um, so JPS S1, um, assuming people fly in tandem, they'll fly in the same orbit, 50 minutes apart, um, at the equator crossing time of 1.30 in the, in the afternoon, uh, local time. Uh, it's really uh, during the summer times, it's daylight saving time, so it's really two, about 2.45 it flies over uh, the United States. It's actually the best time of day one of the best times of day to be able to use the data to predict convective weather events, you know, like uh, thunderstorms and tornadoes. Our European uh, partner, UMETSAT, they have a similar program. Uh, they're going to have a next uh, advance, uh, the new generation of, of instruments, uh, I think launching in 2021, 2022. Uh, they operate in the 930 orbit. So together, uh, we have a, a good data source that is used to feed our numerical weather models. Um, I think Joe might mention this later, but our models run every six hours, and, um, and we need global coverage. And to get global coverage, 
we work with the Europeans, that provides us with the necessary data to, to provide global coverage for the models. Um, so before I turn it over to Joe Pika, I just want to uh, say a few words about our international collaboration. So, um, so JPSS supports the international user community. Um, their operational forecasting, um, as I mentioned earlier, relies heavily on, on polar orbiting data, NOAA's polar orbiting data on a global scale. Throughout the life of JPSS, NOAA will continue a strong legacy of international cooperation. Free and open data uh, is always part of our policy. We have partnerships with UMETSAT, uh, for example, the United Kingdom uh, Meteorology Office, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, the um, Japan Meteorological Agency, the Korean Meteorological Agency, Environmental Canada, Meteor France, WMO, um, Hy Russian Hydro Hydromet. Um, ECMWF, which is a European center. So the bottom line is that every numerical weather prediction center through the, uh, throughout the world uses NOAA polar orbiting data. And so we're happy to contribute to that. Um, and at the same time, JPS assesses our commitment to provide these advanced capabilities up for the next 20 years and even more. So, so consistency is really, really important in applications. So we have a consistent data source of really advanced uh, observations going out for the next 20 years. So while there are many international partners which help JPS's mission, the group of Earth Observations, GEO, which is meeting in DC this week, is uniquely positioned to support our nation's newest environmental satellite system. In its most recent work plan, GEO aims to ensure the long-term availability of sustained, coordinated, and comprehensive satellite Earth observation data, which stresses the need for systems like JPSS. The observations JPSS will provide will be used throughout the development and deployment of many geo initiatives, which assess environmental hazards such as droughts, forest fires, like the catastrophic forest fires in Portugal in mid June that claimed at least 64 lives, air quality and harmful coastal waters, and develop appropriate decision support products and services. So. We have a lot to offer to the entire international community with the launch of JPSS because, uh, because combination of its advanced instrumentation as well as its, its global reach. It's global and the data is free and open. Thank you so much. With that, I'll turn it over to Joe Pika for National Weather Service. Thank you very much, uh, Mitch, for that introduction on uh, JPSS. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of NOAA's National Weather Service, uh, principal user of the, the data that will be coming from the JPSS satellite. Progress has been amazing in both technology and science over the past years, and during this time, NOAA has made significant investments to advance the field of meteorology and improve global weather forecasts. We've improved the science beyond, uh, behind our models. We've increased our supercomputing capacity to support higher resolution global models. And we've improved our efforts to communicate a storm's threat, basically realizing the intrinsic value of that data to uh, inform decisions to protect lives and property. We're also adding new observational tools. As Mitch mentioned, uh, we were able to launch the, the latest generation of the geostationary satellite last November. And now we're going to be uh, launching the latest generation of technology in the Joint Polar Satellite System uh, this November. I'm very excited with all the forecasters of the National Weather Service uh, for the launch of JPSS-1 uh, in two weeks. Satellite observations not only help us monitor and collect uh, information about current weather systems, but they provide and they feed these models uh, that Dr. Goldberg uh, spoke about uh, that allow us to predict the weather today, tomorrow, the weekend, and next week. Uh, this was never more apparent than this uh, last hurricane season. From Hurricane Harvey to Maria, we provided emergency managers, other decision makers with the knowledge they needed uh, to make life-saving decisions well in advance uh, to afford, order effective evacuations, pre-position response assets, and to prepare the public to take action well before the storm got there. For Hurricane Harvey, our forecast based on the polar data, we're able to, to let folks know that the storm was going to hang around in the area and drop a lot of rain, um, record flooding in that area. Uh, for Irma, 
uh, Caribbean islands had five to seven days to prepare for that storm advancing. Florida's governor declared a state of emergency six days in advance of the storm actually making landfall in Florida. So that, that is only possible due to data from polar satellites. For Maria, Puerto Rico started preparing for the worst five days before landfall. And in all of these events, the death rates were well below previous historic storms, such as Hurricane Katrina that hit the Gulf Coast of the United States. Well-coordinated preparedness decisions for these storms were, were based on weather model forecasts that rely on polar satellite data. And the U.S. is not alone in using this data. Countries in the region base their forecasts, their decision-making uh, ability on the models we developed um, and, and put out there uh, based on that data. The forecasts are really impossible to make without robust, high-quality global measurements of the atmosphere that are required to initially initiate the models. Polar satellites are the primary way to obtain the, the global temperature and moisture measurements that feed our weather forecast models. And Dr. Goldberg talked a little bit about how the different instruments have strengths and weaknesses and complement each other to give us that, that global picture of temperature and water vapor to initialize those models. Uh, and, and put another way, the polar satellites are the, are the backbone of our global observing system. The National Weather Service utilizes the data uh, from the European Polar Orbiter as well, and they rely upon our polar data. And our operational data is available to everyone and used by meteorological organizations worldwide. And my colleague uh, Lars Peter will discuss this uh, in a little bit more detail. The instruments on JPSS uh, which have been successfully demonstrated on the SUMI MPP satellite will work in concert to give us a, a complete picture of the phenomena. I, I won't repeat the, the capabilities of the microwave sounder and the infrared sounder that, that uh, Dr. Goldberg brought up, but basically this, this data is used to provide accurate measurements uh, of temperature and moisture inside those hurricanes that we forecast or inside uh, the, the weather fronts that pass over our nations uh, every single day. Um, compared with the predecessor, the infrared sounder um, will have over a thousand more channels than uh, its predecessor and be able to detect the small differences and, of temperature and moisture, and, and uh, Dr. Goldberg alluded to those specifics. We look forward to use of the VIRS data, uh, that high-resolution imagery from the polar sounder. Uh, including uh, one of them called uh, the day-night band, which allows us to observe and predict fog for aviation, to observe and predict ice formations, uh, ice breaking in the Arctic, um, to spot volcanic eruptions, to track fires, um, which, which we've had several in our, our far west uh, United States. Um, it, it really is, in, in the vernacular that Dr. Bold, Goldberg used, the geostationary allows us to maintain situational awareness of what's going on today, now, or in the very near term. VIRS on JPSS allows us to do that, uh, you know, in the Arctic and in our Alaska region. JPSS will also improve our ability to track those storms in those areas where we don't have the current capabilities and where they're out of view of the geostationary. In closing, JPSS is a critical program to the National Weather Service as we fulfill a key role in the broader international system. By advancing our, our polar capabilities to the next level, we will provide forecasters around the world with better information to help decision makers save lives and protect property. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Lars Peter. Thanks very much, Joe, and um, thanks to Noah for uh, inviting me uh, to come and speak to you uh, here this morning. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here and talk to you as a representative of uh, the international user community about uh, what we expect uh, out of this uh, uh, new satellite in, in terms of uh, improving our collective uh, global capabilities to uh, forecast weather and uh, monitor climate. You heard this from uh, Mitch and Joe already, but I want to re-emphasize that uh, weather and climate uh, know no national boundary, 
and meteorology is therefore a global game in the truest uh, sense of the world. So it doesn't matter whether you're here in Washington, D.C., whether you're in L.A., California, or in St. Helena out in the middle of the South Atlantic. If you want to do weather forecasting for the spot where you are sitting or do climate monitoring, you need observations from all over the globe. That's how it, the atmosphere works, and that's how atmospheric models work. My organization, the World Meteorological Organization, is a specialized agency under the United Nations, and we were set up uh, to um, orchestrate and organize and coordinate the uh, exchange of observations uh, among our roughly 200 member states. And without that exchange, you cannot do uh, meteorology, you cannot do weather forecasting and climate uh, modeling, uh, climate monitoring uh, the way that uh, we are used uh, to seeing it today. So most of the observations that, uh, that I exchanged, or that's actually not true, many of the observations are taken from the Earth's surface, uh, from stations on the ground, from weather balloons, from aircraft, from uh, uh, things that are floating on, on uh, buoys in the sea. But the uh, ground-based observations are located primarily where there are people, financial resources to, uh, to have these systems, and infrastructure that can support them. And if you look at the map of the world, most of the planet do not have these uh, financial resources or infrastructure, and that's where satellites are critical. Um, Mitch mentioned this already, but uh, JPSS circles the, uh, the Earth uh, just over 14 times a day. And it does that in a fixed plane in space. Uh, and uh, that is due to the laws of celestial mechanics that uh, that satellite, uh, like any other satellite, has to obey. The Earth is spinning around underneath it uh, as, it's, uh, as uh, the, uh, the satellite is spinning around in its plane. And that means that the satellite will be able to see every single spot on the Earth uh, at least twice per day. And this is critical. So the uh, data that its sensors uh, will provide, uh, therefore, uh, will uh, help us really provide this comprehensive global uh, set of observational data that we need. We know that this is going to be good. We know it from our experience with the precursor satellites, OMA NPP, that is already flying out there. So you may say, uh, okay, we have SUOMA NPP, we're happy with it, why do we need another one up there? There, I'll give you two reasons why, and by the way, only the first of these two reasons uh, played a role in the U.S. government uh, deciding to spend the money of it, but uh, they're both, of them, both of them are very good. The first reason is that even though we are, we are talking about technological information, uh, innovation and scientific breakthroughs, the mantra of practicing meteorologists is operational reliability and operational security. And um, JPSS-1 is an operational system. It is built for operational reliability, soup to knots. And I'm not just referring to the, the satellite that is going to be launched in a couple of weeks. It's really the whole system. It is built for a, a very high level of reliability, and it's built to deliver data very, very quickly, which is critical for meteorology. This may not be the flashiest part of the system, but it's very important nonetheless. You do not want to uh, tinker around w with the data that you don't quite understand or uh, file formats that you haven't quite tested out or unreliable communication lines when a hurricane comes barreling up uh, uh, through the Gulf and, and uh, is approaching the U U.S. Gulf Coast. And you want a system that is able to deliver data 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, also at 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning and also when everybody is sitting down for their Thanksgiving dinner at your, and your staffing levels uh, may be at their minimum. And JPSS-1 uh, is built that way. It's an operational system, and uh, for that, it will be extremely valuable for meteorology. The second reason is that uh, the uh, uh, meteorological models and meteorological users in general are incredibly hungry for data. It's just never enough. Uh, and even though we have SUMA NPP uh, up there already, uh, and as you heard, uh, the new satellite JPSS-1 will be trailing it by 50 minutes uh, when you look uh, up uh, above your heads. We know that that additional data will be used just as aggressively and just as voraciously and, and uh, that it will, be, it will help even further uh, improve our forecast capability. As I said, that's probably not the reason why uh, the satellite was, uh, was funded, but it, it's a very important uh, benefit uh, to the global users nonetheless. 
The final point uh, I want to make here in, in these brief remarks is that uh, observations, no matter how excellent their quality may be, uh, are completely useless unless they end up in the hands of, of, uh, of the right users and uh, ultimately into the computer models uh, that are operated here in this country and, and uh, in, uh, by international partners as well as mentioned by, uh, by both Mitch and Joe. This can sometimes be, uh, be a little bit tricky, let me put it that way. So there are excellent reasons why this international data exchange uh, was orchestrated uh, through us, through a UN agency, and not via, that would be 2,000 bilateral agreements uh, if, if, you, uh, if you are good at uh, combinatorics uh, uh, that these 200 countries would uh, have to make with each other if you want to go that route, which is obviously a different way of, of uh, doing international data exchange. We live in a world of conflict. Uh, we always uh, have. and. Uh, not all nations are, can be on good terms with all other nations at, uh, at all times. And in fact, many of these uh, 2,000 bilateral agreements would not have happened because the countries don't happen to be on speaking terms. So we do this uh, uh, collectively through a UN agency, and, um, and that works, uh, even though there are always countries that need a, a little bit of a push that are maybe not quite happy with uh, having to share their uh, observations with uh, with uh, some of their maybe not best friends who uh, often happen to be uh, their neighbors as well. So on this note, I would like to finish my remarks by commend really commending NOAA and the U.S. government for their uh, consistent commitment uh, to free and open data. Um, this is not only NOAA, by the way. It's not only the U.S. Uh, there are partners uh, out there in Europe and in, in, uh, in China and Japan that follow the same uh, open data policies. But we do like to use you guys, NOAA, and uh, your partners with the same data policies to sort of gently lean on some of the other countries in, in, uh, in our family who might not be quite as, as uh, open and, and uh, free with uh, their data. Free and uh, open access to observational data is ultimately what will let us do the best that we can in terms of sa saving lives and protecting property and uh, helping all nations prosper from uh, improved weather and climate services. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it over to uh, John from NASA. Uh, Good morning. I'm thrilled to be here to represent NASA to talk about JPSS mission. It's an, op it's an important opportunity for us to, to look at a mission that is, uh, will continue to transform the weather forecasting for our nation and actually worldwide. The launch of the JPSS-1 satellite continues nearly 50 years of NOAA-NASA collaboration, including NOAA's predecessor organizations in the development of increasingly advanced operational environmental satellites. The partnership resulted in the launch of the first experimental weather satellite, TROS-1, in 1960, providing forecasters with the first view of the cloud formations from space as they developed and moved across the continent. This partnership between NOAA and its predecessor organizations and NASA have resulted in phenomenal discovery and tremendous evolution of the weather satellite system leading up to the launch of JPSS-1 next month, continuing to grow the cadre of next, generational, next generation operational weather satellites. The Joint Agency Satellite Division, where I work, within NASA's Science Mission Directorate, plays an important role in our partnership with NOAA. We serve as the acquisition arm of NOAA, bringing to bear NASA's engineering, scientific, and launch service expertise to design, build, launch, and commission satellite flight systems, and in the case of JPSS, also the ground system. The program office is a NOAA NASA integrated team located at Goddard Space Flight Center, and I will say that they've done a phenomenal job of, of, with this satellite and the ground system. NASA's launch services program is responsible for the launch portion of this mission, and once the satellite is successfully commissioned, NOAA operates the system to ensure the nation receives the critical weather services uh, data necessary to promote the economy and protect lives and property. JPSS-1, to be named NOAA-20 once in orbit, 
will launch on a Delta II launch vehicle on November 10th, 2017 at 1.47 a.m. Pacific Standard Time from Space Launch Complex at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. On the day before launch, the spacecraft will be powered on and on the launch day, countdown operations are expected to begin at six hours before launch. And after launch, spacecraft is expected to separate from the Delta II upper stage approximately 57 and a half minutes after launch. And approximately 90 days after launch, the operation of the satellite will transfer from NASA to NOAA's Office of Satellite and Production Operations. And that's all I have for today. Thank you so much to our briefers. We appreciate you being here today. And uh, I would like to open the floor now for questions. Um, I would like to remind our journalists and actually our briefers as well to wait for the microphone before um, making your comments or asking your question. We will also be taking questions, I believe, from our Foreign Press Center in New York, who's joined us by DVC. And um, if I could remind members of the media to please introduce yourself by your name and your outlet's name before asking your question. Thank you so much. And for the briefers, we have a floating microphone. You can either come to the podium or, or use a floating microphone. Uh, good morning. Um, Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS over at the American Geophysical Union. Thanks very much for doing this briefing. Um, the first question I've got is, with um, concerns that were voiced previously about there being a potential uh, data gap between the launch of JPSS-1 and uh, hoping that Suomi continued, uh, I'm wondering with that launch now coming up on November 10th, are you starting now to breathe a sigh of relief and if you can talk about that a little bit, what that means. Sure. Um, ab absolutely. Um, you're always concerned um, that there could be a potential gap uh, because SUMI NPP was designed for five years. And JPSS-1, by the way, is designed for seven years. And so there was that potential gap. But the good news is you're right. I mean, the launch is only two weeks away. Uh, the pre-launch characterization of all the JPSS-1 instruments were spot on. And the SUMI MVP instruments right now are operating exceptionally well. So the likelihood of a gap is very, 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 very small now, you know, probably close to 0% uh, because we're so close. And also, we also have other satellites still operating. Um, we have NOAA 15, we have NOAA 18, NOAA 19, and uh, yeah, and SUMI MVP. And so, uh, so the likelihood of a gap is, is virtually zero at this point. Thank you. Next question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Gretel Johnson. I'm with the German Press Agency. Um, I think you just answered one of the questions I had. The lifespan of this is actually seven years. Seven years. That, that's correct. It's seven years, and we launch about every five to six years, so we make sure that we have overlap, you know, like J JPS-2 and JPS-1 will have overlap within its design life, which is really, really important. As uh, Lars Peter mentioned, you know, this is an operational mission, so it's continuity. We can't get lucky. Like, for example, the Aqua satellites, EOS Aqua and Terra, you know, they were designed for seven years, and they've lasted for 15 years. But that's luck. You know, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not luck, but, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you can't take a chance on. So, uh, so yes, uh, we have a seven-year design life. So that means that we're going to have a ro very robust, reliable capability, 24 by 7. And, um, and then we have a sequence of launches that will guarantee that, we're never, uh, that we will never have a gap because of that. I mean, things can always, I, I never like to use the word never because, you know, things can happen. But it's being designed in such that the reliability will be extremely high, like 99.9% .9 yeah. reliability. It's not, the, the part of the story is not that this is so much a replacement of a former satellite. If they have a longer life, you continue collecting data from them. 
as right. I understand. Oh, sure. Um, and there are other satellites up there. You just mentioned that are still functioning. They've lasted longer than expected. So it's not really replacing. It's sort of uh, a new satellite going up, a, a new or fresher version of, of the former one that's that had its life. Yeah, well, in terms of the Pose legacy satellites, remember I mentioned in the previous qu uh, uh, question, you know, we have NOAA 15, 18, 19. They're from an older generation, so they're not nearly as capable as, as the JPSS series. But you still use them. If oh, of course we still there. use them yeah. because they still provide important information. And this one takes the number 20. I mean, that's going to be the next. Number uh, 20, right. So that takes number 20, and that will have these advanced, cap advanced uh, capabilities. Okay. Um, and then back to the, the comments that were made about the sharing of information, um, it seems pretty clear that this is free information that's mm -hmm. available to all of the world's mm -hmm. weather forecasters. They just have to log in and... Well, there's three ways of getting the data. So if you're a power user, like a, a, weather, a weather forecast office or weather prediction center, you can subscribe to the data through our product um, data distribution center. That's one way. If you're a scientist and you don't need the data so quickly, you can go to our archive. All our data is archived for the, for the entire mission life. And then if you're a regional user and you just want data access, you can buy your own antenna. And as the satellite passes over, you can be any part in the world. And you can buy your own antenna, and you can receive the data that way as well. So we really made it. We really designed the systems that anyone can access that data. So we really pushed open, open free data exchange quite a bit. You know, I'll just add to that that uh, you know, under the auspices of the, the World Meteorological Organization, we make that data available on the global telecommunication system to all of our RMEP partners. Okay, and then if I can continue. <laughs> yeah. it, it, will this improve things like what we saw with Irma, for example? With Irma, we understood that the hurricane was headed up the Gulf side of Florida, and as it, as it happened, it was more on, on, on the Atlantic side. So I guess I'm wondering, you've talked, you talked a lot about how this is state of the art, this is the best technology out there. Will it make a difference when it comes to something like that? So I'll just, I'll just state up front that uh, uh, the forecasts for Irma were, were very good and that the, uh, if you looked at the official forecasts, which is based on a blend of models, is we're, we're basically within the cone of uncertainty for that entire time, with even going from one side of Florida to the other. So the, the important part was that, and, and in addition to your, the, the cone or the, the track focused on the actual center of the storm, but the actual impacts were very far reaching and you still got hurricane force winds on the east coast. So the, the bottom line was that the decisions that were made several days in advance, six days in advance, the governor declared a state of emergency to prepare that emergency managers, the governor, FEMA, all had that information and was enough confidence that far in advance to take those steps to protect lives and property. And we saw far fewer deaths than previous very, you know, bad storms. You know, you talk about that. Can you, can we just see if we have another question from another journalist and we can come back if we have time. Uh, and also please remember to wait for the microphone um, for the recording. Uh, do we have another question from uh, one of our, our guests or from New York? Anyone? Okay, we'll take uh, one more and then Gretel, we can come back to you. Thank you again, Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS. Uh, I'm wondering if um, um, the folks from NOAA and National Weather Service can clarify for me, um, how will JPSS-1 help with uh, climate change uh, studies and with climate modeling? Uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, Lars, perhaps if you can also help me to understand what the value of this satellite would be in your estimation for those things. Yeah. So I can mention a little bit about climate. So. 
It's funny, weather, weather forecasting and climate has something in common, and that thing that has in common is that they both require precise observations, so very accurate observations. You know, forecast models are pretty accurate, and so we have to feed a data that's actually more accurate than the forecast model. So that's why JPSS, we're very, it's very important when I mention that we can see sensitivities down to the tenth of degree. That's really, really important because the forecast model might have an uncertainty of like half a degree or 0.3 degrees, and we have to get better than that. So that's important. Now, for the climate, uh, what you want to do is you want to be able to, you know, first of all, all the data that we collect are archived, and then that, you, over time, that creates a long time series. So you want to be able to observe change in the climate. And there's this nice study by Bruce Wilicki uh, from NASA that, he, that actually showed that you always have natural variability in the atmosphere. And so for a climate, to look at a climate signal, especially in the atmospheric temperature, even with perfect observations, you need like 20 years of data to be sure there's a real climate signal. Uh, if you had a measurement accuracy, for example, of 0.3 degrees, uh, so that's 0.3 above maybe a decadal trend of, let's say, 0.1. It would take you 50 years to know if there's actually a climate signal. With JPSS, we're down to the tenth of degree level, which means that will take, uh, I remember his charts, about 27 years. So seven years be beyond a perfect measurement. So yes, we'll contribute to um, observations that basically will be used to monitor how the climate is changing. So, and because it's global observations that, like Lars uh, also mentioned. I'll step up here because otherwise I, I can see mostly the podium. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tap, take a stab at, it, uh, at your question as well. And, and this may be a bit of an unpopular answer, but um, the fact is that you cannot separate weather and climate. Uh, sometimes the political money likes to fund observations and models and research for climate. Sometimes the political money uh, likes to do weather. The two are one and the same. Uh, so if you improve one, uh, you also, whether you want it or not, you will improve the other as well. Uh, the, um, the, link, the strongest link to climate prediction or climate uh, uh, monitoring of the JPSS is actually through its ingest in, uh, in the weather models, through its use in weather models. When you do climate monitoring, you can uh, do, as Mitch suggested, you can do very accurate observations and you wait for a very long time until the statistics are robust enough that you can uh, claim you understood what went on. You can go a different route. You can ingest all the observations in the weather model and let that sort of massage the statistics and uh, you get to a robust statistic much, much more quickly. I'll, I'll try to give you an example to, uh, to let you, uh, that maybe will help you, uh, help you understand what I'm talking about. If you are interested in the evolution of uh, the surface temperature in, uh, in a spot near where you live, you might go to the local airport uh, and that may have a very long observational time series. But maybe 50 years ago that was a grassy field and now it's uh, three square miles of concrete. So you cannot use that observation uh, as an indicator for climate change because the environment around it has changed so much. Or maybe they bought a different uh, measurement device uh, that uh, may have different characteristics. So if you instead take millions of these observations and put them into this uh, uh, regularization framework that a weather model is, you can get at your answer much more quickly. So. That's why I'm saying the, the uh, weather and climate is really linked at the hip, and uh, JPSS uh, will uh, provide, whether you want it or not, great progress in, in both areas. <laughs> Do we have one from anyone else? Anyone from New York? Okay, Gretel, we'll come back to you. Well, I was just going to go back to what you were saying about the forecasting and using this term, the cone of, of sorry, un uncertainty, uh, uncertainty? Um, and whether it's improved based on this kind of data. I think your point was it may not matter because the impact is all across this area, but when we're writing about these weather events, we often focus on, you know, where is it going to go and what's the path and what's the cone of uncertainty. And I wondered if this kind of data helps you narrow it 
and improve something like that for people in the path. Absolutely, and, and thanks for that follow-up question because that's that's absolutely the, the the last part that I needed to add is that you know what we provided for say Harvey hanging out over the Texas Louisiana area or where Irma was going those forecasts were based upon this polar data and the improvements we've made over the years to the science and the models the high performance computing this uh, this infrastructure that we've we purchased for satellites to make this from 20 years ago where confidence was at the two-day mark versus today where we were providing out a pretty good forecast out to seven days for emergency managers FEMA state governments to actually make a decision uh, to inform our, our Caribbean partners hey get ready for this this is what's going to happen and and the forecasts are have been very good uh, over that time based on all of those advances we've made and JPSS is the latest and greatest uh, of those advances I remember one study on weather service did for us back in I think 2012 when we wanted to demonstrate the importance of satellite because you know there were budget concerns and things like that back then and uh, I think it was Hurricane Irene where they they we ran the forecasts without data like JPSS, so without an advanced microwave, without an advanced hyperspectral. And it turned out that um, the center of the track was about the same, you know, with and without, right? Uh, but the cone of uncertainty was a lot wider, and it would have resulted uh, in an evacuation of the whole coastline of Florida. But with the data, it turned out that it was much more narrow, so Florida was spare. So that's the, the so the cone of uncertainty is really important, and of course it, it you know weather forecast models are not perfect right so so you still have to you know and people come somebody complain wait a minute we were in the cone of uncertainty and nothing happens well that's what we mean by cone of uncertainty something can happen so you know the flip side is that something does happen and then you say hey why didn't you tell us and so the thing about the west coast Gulf Coast and you know east coast of Florida it's funny so. Like I'm with Joe, you know, it, it was a great weather forecast. Early Tuesday morning, I think on the September 5th, it showed Sunday morning Hurricane Irma right off of Key West, Florida. That's exceptional. If you go back to Hurricane uh, Sandy, everyone was so excited about, you know, ECMWF did a great job, five-day forecast. That five-day forecast showed it, that it was going to hit Delaware, right off the Delaware coast. You know, it actually hit like the northern New Jersey Atlantic coast. That distance of miles is the same distance between the west coast and east coast of Florida. <laughs> so you got to put things in perspective. In this case, the whole entire state of Florida was under emergency uh, preparation. So it was actually a well forecasted storm. And, and it was the important thing that people were there seven days earlier to get ready for that storm. And that's really the wide pole Sally data. Uh, I don't know if we threw out these statistics, but 85% of all data that's used in numerical weather prediction models come from polar, polar orbiting satellite data. And out of all that data, when they figure out which observation type contributes the most for reducing forecast error, about 60% of that information comes from microwave and infrared sounders. So, so that's why JPSS is really, really important because it provides that continuity of key, these key observations of weather forecasting out to the next 20 years and beyond. Um, if there are no other questions, we'll close. We have time for one last question um, from New York or one of our journalists that has not asked a question yet. Okay, last question. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Randy Shostak with EOS. I'm wondering, uh, and this may not be something that the folks from the federal government can answer, but perhaps Lars, you could, uh, and you can give it a try, for instance. Um, with Congress uh, currently considering the budget for the polar follow-ons, and there being a big question about that, I'm wondering, what is your best argument to put forth that those should be fully uh, funded? Well, I, I can say something. Uh, well. People just have to re, re, re uh, I'll just say something so gentle, uh, that it's so gentle, but people just have to remember that satellite observations and weather forecasting are joined at the hip, and that's critical. So 
you really can't separate the two. So if, if people understand the criticality of weather forecasting, then people have to understand the criticality of satellite observations that feed the weather forecast models. That was pretty gentle, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll, just, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and emphasize yeah. this, the same point of just trying to explain here is the benefit yeah. you know, of, of those observations on what we do to protect lives and property. And we'll continue to state that. I don't work for the federal government, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, there are various economic studies uh, that have been done by the World Bank and uh, by a number of uh, international organizations, and, and actually by some consultant companies and, uh, and a couple of research organizations uh, in this country. The return on investment uh, in meteorological infrastructure is anywhere between 10 to 1 and 100 to 1. It's generally an excellent investment. And of course, there will be the, the big aerospace companies have, uh, uh, have their uh, friends in Congress that they're going to talk to. And there, there are other benefits uh, in terms of jobs and, and uh, technological advancements, et cetera, et cetera. There are many reasons for flying satellite programs. Uh, that have nothing to do with the user benefits. But just in terms of the user benefit, the return on investment it has, is excellent. And there's any number of, of uh, economic uh, uh, studies that back it up, in addition to the, the general concerns about uh, saving lives and property. So that's what I would say. <laughs> All right, well, thank you again for coming. And thank you, New York, for joining us uh, via uh, DVC. And with that, we conclude our briefing for today. Thank you so much.